Hello, today on my channel you will hear an amazing story about life. I hope you enjoy this story. This one struck me to the core. Honestly, I still can't forget it. Enjoy watching. Billy led Lucy down the hallway, but she had no idea where they were going. Ever since their daughter Julia had gone missing, nothing mattered to her anymore. She'd been separated from her husband, the girl's father, a long time ago. They were two different people. Lucy Dressmaker High Class worked in the theater, selling costumes of bygone eras, a quiet and dreamy woman who in ordinary life was satisfied with Lil. More important to her was her spiritual kinship with those around her. And Billy the cop, as they used to say, today they call him a cop. He always wanted things to be just like people. And he was ready to go out of his way to earn himself a prestigious car, expensive repairs. He was angry that his wife did not appreciate it all, but paid so little attention to it. And on the contrary, it pissed him off if Lucy started talking about something deeply alien to him about books, literature, music. I'm so sick of you, he said through his teeth. When they decided to separate, of course, Julia stayed with her mother. Billy didn't have to assert his rights to his daughter. Moreover, Lucy did not put any obstacles he could come to the girl at any time. At that time, Julia was still very young, and her father remembered her three times a year. On New Year's holidays, he brought his daughter a sweet gift. On the 8th of March, he hastily bought a skinny bouquet of mimosas at a bus stop somewhere, and on her birthday, he showed up with another soft toy. That was the end of his fatherly duty. Later, he finally weaned himself off the child and didn't come at all. But now that Julia was missing and Lucy turned to him, she knew that her father's house was the last place her daughter would go, that Julia might not even remember where Billy lived. Still, Lucy called her ex-husband. Suddenly, he became furious and held Lucy responsible for everything. She was the one who had behaved in such a way that Julia had run away. His ex-wife had robbed him of his daughter. And now he was dragging her down the hallway. Lucy hadn't even quite realized where he brought her. A corridor painted green, doors with metal windows. Billy unlocked one of the cells and pushed Lucy in. The young woman was horrified to see that the inside was full of men, prisoners. Stomp on her, Billy muttered, and the door slammed shut behind him. Lucy's eyes blurred, and she leaned against the wall. How could it be that they had met and fallen in love, or rather thought they had? Lucy had grown up in a family of very right parents. Her father was an engineer, her mother ran a bookstore. In times of scarcity it was a bread and butter place, but mom, you could say, did not take bribes. Of course, she did not refuse a box of chocolates and favorably accepted a crystal vase in gratitude for an imported detective. But there were no serious complaints about her work, and she stayed in her place for many years until her retirement. Thanks to this, Lucy was not spoiled with books from childhood, she read as much as she wanted. Of course, her father and mother thought that she would get a higher education, but sewing became a real hobby of the girl. Whether it was a costume ball, school or school evening, Lucy composed such outfits for herself and her friends that all hail. And after school, she went to school, comforting her parents with the promise that later she will graduate from university and become a fashion designer. Father and mother made sense, realizing that the daughter entered those years when the creation of a family is not far off, they traded the apartment, added money, and now they had a two-room Stalinka, and Lucy also has a two-room, but Khrushchevka. When you get married, you don't know how wealthy your husband will be. And now you have your own place anyway, her father told her. You see, we have already gone through all this period. When the spouses get accustomed to each other, a child is born, sleepless nights begin, and we would not want to face all this again, added the mother. The best way to maintain a good relationship with an adult daughter, son in law, and husband to live separately from them. So Lucy had to be on her own very early on. Her friends at the school envied her, they did not have separate apartments. Lucy, when she returned in the evenings to an empty house, sometimes with difficulty held back tears. Such loneliness was agonizing for her. Billy lived in the same yard. His family had many children, but the boys were raised by one mother. She worked as a dishwasher in a cafe and until the boys got on their feet, there was blatant poverty all around. There wasn't even enough money for curtains, the top of the windows in the apartment were covered with newspapers. Maybe that's why they joined the militia, they thought that with such a profession they wouldn't be left without a job or a piece of bread. Billy noticed a new girl who appeared in the yard, found out that she lived in a neighboring house, 
and soon began courting her. Both were young, good-looking, and both were deceived into mistaking simple attraction to each other for love. The wedding was modest. Lucy's parents did not approve of her daughter's choice and did not come at all. The tables were set at home. Billy's relatives and a few young friends of the bride and groom were invited. Julia was born two years after the wedding. Billy was deeply disappointed he wanted a son. And yet at that time the couple still thought about the future. The husband tried to earn more money by right and wrong, came home only at night, and Lucy around the clock fiddled with the baby. Julia was just beginning to walk when her parents began to quarrel, her father shouted that her mother did not appreciate his efforts, and Lucy cried and objected, saying that she continued to feel lonely, and her father had long since made friends. Then they separated, and Julia's upbringing as a thoughtful and dreamy girl was left entirely to Lucy. Like her other peers, Julia grew up in a stone jungle, a trampled yard and dull brick five-story buildings that surround it. Once a journalist came to visit Lucy, he found mother and daughter at work. Julia was drawing. Mom was sewing a dress for Panaka. She was a theater master on all hands and sketches of costumes, and their embodiment was all on her. The journalist sat, chatted with them about this and that, and then waved his hands and asked, How can you create here? In a house like this? It's the third street of builders. Everything is generic and personal. There can't be any inspiration here. Mom smiled. She could smile like that, as if she didn't argue and softly, but as if she knew a secret. They had their secrets here. The apartment was on the top floor, with the roof and the sky just above their heads. The month was landing on the roof. Yesterday Mama called Julia. Look how he's lying down today. He was lying on his back, horns up, thin, newborn, golden, and he was no worse for wear, and they could see the river from their balcony. Go down into the city, at the bottom of a well, and all around is the megalopolis humming with passing cars. Come up here, up to the sky, and see that in the distance lay a silver mirror of the river, and beyond it the mountains rising. And even here, in their rooms, magic lived too. It seems that books are the main masters here. The shelves take up a whole wall, lots of shelves and lots of books, they're crammed from floor to ceiling. My mom's friends used to say, throw them away, who reads such antiquity nowadays? Paperbacks. Your whole library can be downloaded into one ebook, and how much dust will disappear with those old folios, and free up space. What for? Mom asked. She didn't see an equal substitute for books. She took another volume off the shelf like a tracker. Look, Julia, what I found. A narrow flower lying between the pages. With this volume of poetry, I used to climb the mountain when I was in 10th grade. My mom sued. Julia loved her old machine, her grandmother's black one where you could turn the knob. Mom would unplug something and let Julia twist the handle as much as she wanted. And the new machine, white, electric, stitched when you put your foot on the pedal. It was a business-like machine, it didn't like to play jokes. And if you hesitated, once it stitched Julia's finger, it didn't hurt so much as it was scary that the needle went so deep. From then on, Julia avoided the machine. And her mother sat up every day until late at night sewing. The fabrics were fabulous. Purple satin and velvet the color of night, weightless haze and gold rhinestones that made colored lights on the walls. Who's this for? Julia asked. The Nutcracker play. Mom turned on the tape and waltz of the flowers spun the Julia the room. The house and the whole city, the whole world, the flakes of snow outside the window all carried in the waltz. Julia was the first to try on the dresses. They were too big for her. She still had to grow up to the fairy tale. Julia sat breathless. Then the mannequins put on the dresses. Julia was used to seeing the shadows they cast as she walked through the house in the evenings. Men in camisoles and cloaks, ladies in ball gowns. When Mama went out, Julia was not alone. Ladies and gentlemen with impeccably straight faces turned their heads toward each other and talked inaudibly, and Julia thought that one day she would understand their language. And then Mama came and said, Julia, I bought a summer house. Julia didn't even realize it at first. There are mansions with swimming pools, tennis courts, rose gardens, and stuff like that. Mom could say she bought a yacht, or a star. With what? She didn't get it. You see, that's the nonsense. The guy was selling the dacha for pennies. It used to belong to his grandmother, and the grandmother was a blockade survivor. When he took them kids out, they ate anything they thought they could eat. Anything green. Like deer cubs chewed leaves, twigs, 
and perhaps in memory of those months that they came to life after hunger, Veronica and did not abandon the dacha until she was very old. But now her grandson lives in another city and he can't afford to come here. Most young people are not going to bend their backs and grow cucumbers and tomatoes. And he literally gave me the dacha for a pittance with the words, from one good hand to another good hand. And what are we going to do there? Grow tomatoes? No, we'll be gone all summer. I went and looked at it. That's a little house. And there's a well with clean water. The trees are blooming. And the fence is so high you can sunbathe naked. And we'll forget about the hot asphalt and the noise of the cars even at night. I'll take my typewriter with me and I'll sue there. In the fall the theater will start the season I have plenty of work. All the costumes for the new play are mine. We'll take a telephone to communicate with the big earth. And above us there will be only the sky. During the day with leisurely clouds like air castles and at night with the whole universe and the month. And instead of the smell of gasoline, the subtle fragrance of apple blossoms, and instead of trolley buses, the hum of bees. And the books. Julia asked excitedly, will we take books with us? As many as you like, they're all we have to take. We don't have many things. Do you have any pictures of the cottage? Show me. Mom took out her phone and started flipping through the album. Here, here and here. See, this is the well, this is the garden, and this is the cottage itself. Oh, quietly said Julia. Paused for a couple minutes and said, yes, that's right. It's all fairy tale like in there. The garden is pure sleeping beauty when everything was overgrown there for a hundred years, and then the prince with the sword cut through this jungle. There's bound to be a monster in the well by now. And the cabin. Well, that's mom's cue. Remember that Charlie Chaplin movie, New Times? There his girlfriend bought a dream house, where everything was falling, crumbling and falling apart. Well, mom said, that's what we'll call our villa. It has to have a name. Let's call it Chaplinka. It's not a big deal. We just have to put our hands on it. Whose hands? Our hands. I think we need a man's hands. Where will we get them? Mom said thoughtfully, let's think that ours are also good for something. But there's a forest around, and a lake. You already said that. Is the lake like in New Times when Charlie Chaplin fell in a puddle? Mom was carrying a wheeled bag with stuff in it and another bag with groceries in the other hand. Julia was loaded with books and a camera and all the other treasures she was sure to take with her. They turned off the wide road with narrow islands of green grass and golden dandelions in the middle and took the narrow road straight into the woods. Julia wanted them to go all the way to the end so that their cottage would be the closest to the forest, and it was. Here, said her mother, confidently in a masterly way, opening the wooden gate, come in and see our property. Here's the house. Mom unlocked a small door, boarded, painted with green paint. It was still shiny. Maybe the owners hadn't wanted to sell a house recently, or maybe they had decided to update it a little to make it look more marketable, the way an old dog gets a new collar before it goes to market. Mom, who lived here before, that poor old lady. Yeah, I told you, she died, and then her grandson took over. The grandson sold Lucy the cottage with everything that was there. He didn't need the stuff himself. And everything in the house was the same as it was when the old lady died. A small glassed-in veranda. There was a narrow sofa for a grown man who couldn't sleep, only sit. A dresser with locked drawers. A sink and a table with a two-burner electric stove. There were curtains of cheap white tow. It was nothing to turn the sun's rays into lacy shadows. A waffle towel hung over the sink. And the soap dish was a green soap dish with foamy streaks as if it had been swept up by a sea wave. And the unpretentious utensils were in place spoons, rats, cookware. Mother opened the door to the only room. A narrow iron bed of handboards as if iron fists clenched the bar. A chair with wooden arms, covered with a knitted blue cape, a window to the garden. Do you like it? Mom asked. Julia shrugged warily for the time being. Are you going to unpack now? Mom asked. Well, go on. Take a walk and look around. I'll start to settle in and make us something for dinner. Yeah, there's a well, so you be careful, watch out. Julia went out and put her face in the sun. It was so hot, so gentle, the same as in town. It was as if she had never been away. Julia went to look around. Lucy turned on the kettle. It waited a few seconds, and then it mumbled so quietly and cozily 
starting to heat up. Lucy remembered the house as she got ready for work in the mornings, first getting out of bed and turning on the kettle, and lie in the still darkness, staring at its orange glow, listening to the squeaky, uncomplicated song. A few blissful minutes before getting up, brewing a mug of strong coffee, starting the day that was still night. Lucy opened the door to the garden, shouted, Julia, dinner. In the evening they sat on the porch, eating ice cream drizzled with cherry jam, and enjoyed the sunset. The garden was fresh at once, not just cool, but smelling of winter, of recently melted snow. And in this damp, cold air, the smells of all the herbs and flowers became especially strong. Tulips, already folded, locked their bowls, and the delicate sweet smell of daffodils, and the dizzying breath of cherry blossoms came from somewhere. Choke cherry blossoms are cold, my mother said a line, probably from some old poem, and added, my grandmother always said so. Are there wolves around here? Julie asked in a whisper. No, mom said, my friend, the traveler, told me that there are hardly any left. She only saw one, a skinny teenage wolf cub. She went to hear him sing to the moon. But he's got a mom somewhere if he's a teenager. Julia reasoned, which means he's got a dad. He's got a daddy. And brothers and sisters, most likely. Mommy patted her head, ruffled her light blonde curls. My little wolf, let's go to bed. This fresh air makes me drunk. The traditions of their summer home were born in a hurry, washing from the hand basin in the garden, brushing teeth. Mother made Julia's bed on the sofa, the one on the veranda. She lit the lamp. Julia shuddered. Now for everything there we are like an illuminated shop window. And even if anyone who didn't already know we were here now knows, the forest knows. A fairy tale? Mom asked. Julia was, of course, too old now, and she truly despised the tales of roosters and foxes and bunnies that they fed to the little ones to make them finish their porridge. So Mama had to find and invent unusual tales. And then when Julia told any of the girls with whom she vacationed together at summer camp, no one knew these stories. Most of all Julia loved the fairy tale about a little dressmaker who sewed dresses of magical beauty from noble ladies. When a prince came to match them, but the prince fell in love not with the court beauties, but with the dressmaker, a girl exhausted by urgent work. It's just a pity. That in the end, the young man turned out to be a lackey of the prince, who wanted thus to deflect from marriage. Maybe she was so close to this fairy tale because she saw her mother sitting at the typewriter until late at night, and she thought that someday her mother would make her such a magically beautiful dress. Lucy brought a downy shawl and wrapped Julia up. The nights are still cold. The shawl was so warm, it smelled of their home. Mama turned out the light and went to her room. Not only the moonlight illuminated the veranda. Grape leaves clung to the glass, peering in, baiting to be let in. Julia was afraid to put her feet down on the floor. She knew that what lived in the garden saw her now as well as in the light. Now his hour had come. And there was no hiding from it under a blanket. It's that all-penetrating gaze of V. Lift my eyelids. Lift them up and I'll see. None of the things that have been here will interest him. Not the cups, not the soda pack, not the cutting ward, not the old chair. Just the girl lying on the couch. Julia threw a down shawl over her head, hid under it, and that warmth suddenly began to soothe her. Warmth and fluffy curls, the down of a living thing, maybe a goat. She was protected by the goat stood sideways between her and the night, covered her. Julia was still afraid, but already she was falling into sleep. It was stronger than her. And when she opened her eyes, by all clocks still at night, but by the laws of spring at dawn, the sky was already distinctly blue, and everything was drowning in the night eagle's trills. Lucy was sewing. The room was lit by the light of a sconce as old as everything here. A long glass plafond, tarnished, shaped like a fox love flower. It was almost identical to the one she'd had in the house where she'd grown up with her grandparents. Her grandmother had taught her to sew too. And when Lucy was very young, she was allowed to spin the wheel of the black sewing machine. Her grandmother was a great craftswoman. Even when she was short of materials and threads, she transformed some corrugations into works of art, embroidering them with bouquets of flowers, cross-stitch, and ironwork. Lucy had taken it all from her grandmother because it made her feel cozy and relaxed when she sat down to do some needlework. Her thoughts at once became clear, came to order, it was easy to think of everything. And no matter what happened at school, from a fail in German to a quarrel with her roommate, everything lost its sharpness, went into the category of, well, it happens. 
Lucy looked at the wooden clock with a pendulum hanging on the wall and quietly groaned half past two. She got up, took a long crunchy stretch. She put the dress on the hangers and hung it in the closet. And when she went to wash her face and fearfully stepped into the black night garden, she saw that a hedgehog had come to visit. A medium-sized hedgehog was sniffing around the porch. Lucy smiled involuntarily. No apples yet, little one. What can I get you? Wait a minute. She returned with a saucer full of milk. She put it near the guest and sat down quietly on the porch steps. The hedgehog didn't show much fear. He had lived here all winter without people. Maybe he had never seen any of them, or maybe they had never heard him. And he didn't know yet that they were to be feared. He climbed into the saucer with his front paws and began to lap the milk quickly, choking. Don't be in a hurry, I'll get more, Lucy almost laughed. And suddenly this garden, and the woods beyond the fence, and the night itself seemed to be her allies, and she felt no more fear. Nothing here could harm them. All danger came from where the sky glowed with a reddish hue, where the city was. Wasn't it true what the little prince said you could hear the stars laughing? The wicked door creaked. Soon they would recognize its voice, and they would understand that the wicked is the first to greet the guests, and the last to see them off, wishing them a happy journey with its creaky old voice. But now the sounds were rhythmic or something. Look, what is it? Mom asked, wiping her hands on her apron. Julia went, but Mom went too, so they saw the girl at the same time. There was a girl of about eight years old riding on the wicked like a swing, firmly bunched, almost full-figured, cheeky, her blonde hair tied up in two short ponytails. The girl was dressed in denim overalls and sneakers. She pushed off and the wicket slid forward and then drew the girl back a real swing. As she did so, the girl looked at her mom and Julia, smiling, definitely not doubting that she had come to see her friends. Oh my God, cried the mother, you'll break it. Come in, come in, but leave the wicket alone. We have no one to fix it if we do. Uncle Austin can, said the girl eagerly though, jumping down to the ground and walking with the others towards the house, he fixes everything here, whoever needs it. Maybe it's better not to break it. There you go, Julia, and you were afraid you wouldn't have any company here. Please, girlfriend. She's younger than me, Julia said grudgingly. At school, she'd often been picked on by the little kids. The older kids were always honored by the little ones. Of course, it's touching when they run to you at recess, spreading their arms to hug you selflessly or when they're ready to share the last candy with you, but sometimes you want peace and privacy. What's your name? Mom asked. Betty. Do you have snakes? The girl asked in a business-like manner. No, I don't think so. Are there snakes here? Mom was scared. Aunt Kathy said that a two-meter black viker came to her cottage. It ate the magpies chicks. Now Aunt Kathy's afraid to open the door in the morning in case it's warming up on the porch. And she's afraid to pick strawberries too. And Uncle Anthony says that Aunt Kathy is a snake herself and lured the viper, a kindred spirit. Would you like some tea? Betty's mom asked. Do you have anything sweet? Betty asked hopefully. Mom put a couple of slices of bun in the toaster and after a few minutes took them out brown. She opened the apricot jam. Betty had never tasted this before and appreciated it with delight. Wow, even tastier than candy. I ate all the candy the day before yesterday and Grandma said that next time she'd buy some from her pension. Do you live here only with Grandma? Mom asked. Well, yes, Mom and Dad work, they come on weekends, and also Aunt Kathy lives here, Uncle Anthony. Yeah, we get it. And snakes. Aunt Katia, Uncle Sergi, the one everyone asks for the latter, Aunt Lena. So Mom said quietly, we've isolated ourselves well. Let's go for a walk. Betty spoke to Julia, as simply as if she didn't think she'd disagree, why are you sitting here all day? I'll show you the lake. Have you seen the castle? What castle? Julia asked perplexed and looked at her mom, whether she should go or not. Her mother's look was a little confused. Well, you're not going to fall into that lake, are you? You're not going to drown, are you? Even frogs don't drown there, assured Betty, standing up, or rather, jumping up and wiping her hands on her overalls, let's go. She ran down the path, her sandals glistening, Julia shrugged her shoulders and started to catch up with her. There are lots of lakes, Betty explained. She couldn't walk still. And if she didn't run, she jumped up and down, but they were more like puddles. But the one I'll show you is normal. There are even fish there. Uncle Stepan used to go there with a fishing rod. But the fish are so small, 
he said he catches them for the cat. And when he didn't look at the can, I put it back in the lake. They're baby fish, let them grow up. They say there's another lake, a very big one, and there's even an island in it. But they won't let me go there alone. My dad says we'll go together, but he has no time when he comes to visit. Grandma makes me dig beds or fix the roof. I scare my dad that I'll go into the woods alone and let him look for me. They reached the end of the cottage street where the forest began at once. Are there wolves here? Julie asked, not expecting a clear answer. The devil knows, said Betty. Uncle Simeon's bicycle went missing the other day. He was looking for it. I asked him, maybe the wolves ate it. He says, Betty, what are you doing? It's iron. And I said, wolves are like that. They eat everything. So you wanted to go into the woods and get caught in their teeth. It's in the daytime, Betty explained. It's all right in the daytime. Shall we go out at night and hear if the wolves howl or not? If they howl, they must be here. I'll bet they do, Julia muttered, trying to keep up. Betty took the small hill hen on. At the top were thickets of maple trees, as ubiquitous as the baobabs on the planet of the little prince. There was a dilapidated wooden fence too, and Betty slipped through the hole, followed by Julia. She wanted to ask how much farther was it, but Betty was already standing at the top of the fence, pointing. This is it. They were here alone, and no one else but them at this hour. The lake was curving, going off into the distance. Where it ended, there were already densely stretched cottages, towering power lines, there was life. And here at the girl's feet, it was almost a round bowl. A forest of pine and birch trees grew along the banks, and silence. Here, on this shore, there was even a semblance of a beach, shallow water. But there, on the other side, the shore was steep, and Julia thought that the depth there was quite deep. Who lives there? Julia asked involuntarily. Betty looked at her, and as businesslike as she had been enlisting Aunt Kathy, Uncle Anthony and the others, began to name them. Frogs, tadpoles are little frogs, crawfish and crucifers, mosquitoes, the nasties, dragonflies, and the watermen, and the mermaids? What about? Julia sat down on the grass, wrapped her arms around her knees. And you probably don't believe in anything, do you? She asked, well, that it could all be in life. Betty sat down next to her. Tell me what to believe in Santa Claus, she said contemptuously, when I know that in our school he's played by a gym teacher dressed as Santa Claus, and the red coat and beard all year long in the school closet hanging. My mom once got me a ticket to a Christmas tree at the Palace of Culture. There was such a Santa Claus there he was gorgeous, his coat and hat were covered in silver and glitter. And then we went round the circle, he took me by the hand, and I looked closely, his beard was also tied. Probably just a rich janitor at the Palace of Culture. Bob himself such a fur coat. I don't mean that Julia said thoughtfully, I don't believe in Santa Claus either, but I mean that here in this forest, in this lake, may live something that people do not believe that it exists, and it does. Betty looked at her with eager curiosity, and Julia went on. I believe in ghosts. That abandoned and deserted houses are haunted by the souls of those who once lived there. When I come to the forest, it seems to me that here somewhere in the thicket you can see a forest lion, and he, if he wants to, will really lead and lure, so that you will not get home. Few people disappeared in the forests, and nobody found them and didn't know what happened to them. And the lake, she continued, you don't know how deep it is, do you? No one has ever measured it. What if there's a pool there, and a real waterman lives there? Like in the movie, Mary the Artisan. You go swimming and something cold slides down your leg. That's the waterman tickling your heel. And mermaids. I've got a picture at home of them resting on the shore on a moonlit night. They look like they're alive. Mermaids are those girls who drown themselves because of unhappy love or just an unhappy life. Maybe there were mermaids in these parts. And when the full moon comes, they come ashore to look at the land, to brush their long hair, and maybe to lure a careless traveler into their pool. Bithy sat deep in thought, scratching her heel. I'll come here when the mood is round, she promised Julia or herself. And then she said, would you like me to show you the castle where the enchanted boy lives? Are you kidding? Julia asked incredulously, what castle could there be? Dicey. Betty jumped up. She didn't seem to be able to walk at all. She was always running or jumping. Let's go and see. I can't catch you. Through these winding, grassy streets, which Julia thought she would never remember, 
and would get lost on her own. She raced like an arrow that had been pulled from a bowstring. She turned down some alleyway and jabbed her finger. There. And then Julia saw it. It was indeed a castle, but it was small, the size of a two-story mansion. That made it look like a toy. But the owner was very fond of the Middle Ages, because it was not a novelty like the countless constructors, where you can create anything from plastic parts. The heavy stone of some marvelous silvery hue seemed to come from centuries past. And the towers, Julia counted seven of them with silver tile roofs. And did the lantern above the entrance shine? The glass was dark, smoky as if it had been smoked. And at the top of the tallest tower there was a stained glass window and a small balcony where only swallows could sit. See? Betty squinted, and no one grew potatoes and cabbages here. A few blue spruce trees surrounded the castle, and there were green roses blooming. What about the enchanted boy? Julia believed everything now. You see, it's like no one loves here but him. He's the only one who goes out every day to get milk, and in the evening, that tall window lights up. You said that, and now I'm thinking maybe the boy's been bewitched and can't leave the castle ever. You know, no adults, no one just him. And he's also so handsome. It's a nightmare, a disaster. Julia smiled, this time with an affectionate sneer. She had decided that Betty had a crush on this boy. Going out once a day. Well, then we certainly won't wait for him. And then, as if to contradict her confident words, the door of the castle opened, and a boy came running down the steps. He was about 14, maybe 15. He was tanned, the kind of tan that light-skinned people get when they spend months in the sun. His golden hair had grown back and curled in picturesque curls. The parting of the black eyebrows, the very light gray-blue eyes, the plump, well-defined lips. Betty had perhaps not exaggerated, but even understated. The boy wore a white shirt and shorts, a white plastic bag in his hands. He had seen Betty more than once before and was about to nod to her, but then he noticed an unfamiliar face nearby. He looked at Julia with interest and even hesitated a little, as if he wanted to say something. And against her will, Julia felt her face begin to burn, which meant she was blushing desperately. He liked you. Betty tugged at her arm. He goes out of his castle, Julia said, so he's not bewitched at all, he can go anywhere. But he always comes back. And would you go back to where you live? But Betty had already had a new thought. Did he lock the door behind him? Maybe we could look inside quietly and see what's in there. I'm frightfully curious. I've never been in a castle before. Are you crazy? But Julia saw that her little friend was determined and realized that she had to be distracted. Listen, doesn't your grandmother worry that you disappear for the whole day? No. She used to be afraid I'd run around hungry all night. But I say someone always feeds me. Uncle Alexander knows how to fry potatoes. Aunt Kathy has a whole lunch, but Uncle Archie... He doesn't know how to do anything. We have tea with him. With rusks. Why don't we go to our house? I don't think we have any rusks. But for lunch, mom makes all sorts of delicious things. Wait, Betty said impatiently, they'll be home soon. Your mom's borscht isn't any prettier than his anyway. Julia snorted. She wanted to say, all right, then you stay here and wait, and I'll. She herself didn't know what kept her in place. She sank down beside Betty on the grass. So he only feeds on milk? Doesn't he bring anything else? She asked with interest. Betty's shoulder twitched, and Julia realized she had to change the subject. As if by the way, she began to talk about the things she'd found in the old barn. She also mentioned that they had a well in the garden. Can you see the stars from there? Betty was keenly interested. How would I know? It's dark and scary there. That's why you can see them. It's day here and night there. And of course there are stars in the sky, and even the moon. Let's climb down tomorrow and see. Uh, no, I'll pass, Julia laughed. Why are you drawn everywhere? Julia asked, panting. She could barely keep up with Betty, sometimes seeing only her green pants with the back pocket hanging out. Betty flew through the woods like a spirit. Early in the morning, she went in to pick up Julia. It seemed as if she hadn't come in, but had appeared under the window at the exact hour when the sky was just beginning to turn blue in the east. She appeared out of the darkness that was gathering near the lilac bush and whistled softly, and she didn't warn me, damn it, if Julia hadn't slept so soundly that night, never once drifting off into the maelstrom of dreams, she wouldn't have heard it. Betty would have had to climb through the window and rouse her, but Julia, 
Hearing the whistling, raised her head at once. Within seconds, she realized she wasn't dreaming. It was dawn and someone was calling her. She didn't dare open the door and looked out the window. You'll be here soon? Betty paused, ready to burst out of her seat. Why? Where to? Julia couldn't understand. To the lake. My grandmother's the kind of woman who won't let me out at night. She goes to all the rooms first, locks the door, and makes sure the windows are closed. Then she sits next to me until I fall asleep. You can't escape in the evening, but in the morning. And how did you get out? Julia asked hopelessly. Through the window. It is high to jump there, of course, but... And Betty waved her hand. Maybe the mermaids are still sitting there. Knocked on. Come on, let's go check it out. Julia realized at once that she had no choice. If she hesitated, if she refused, the girl would run into the woods alone, her heels glistening. Would she ever find her way back, and most importantly, would she ever fall into that damn lake? Julia put her finger to her lips and signaled for Betty to wait for her. She'd be right out of the house. There was no time for morning chores like washing her face and brushing her teeth. Don't wake up mommy, and at the same time let her know not to faint when she realized her daughter was gone. Julia pulled her blue dress over her head. After only a few minutes in the woods, she would realize it was a mistake. It's cold at dawn, I wish I had a blouse, and pants because the nettles are whipping at her bare legs. Meanwhile, Julia scribbled a note in pencil on a piece of paper torn hastily from her notebook. I'm off to watch the sunrise, I'll be back soon. Mama didn't need to know about the lake. And now they were traveling through the forest. Betty said there was a path, but she was the only one who could see it, and Julia stumbled a couple of times, falling into shallow holes, but for some reason only with her right foot. The ferns grew tall here, but it would have been better if she hadn't accidentally told Betty that they were supposed to blue on Evan's night. She'd look all over the forest, and every fern would look under its fluffy green tail. There were so many nails. My feet were burning. They approached the lake from the other side. There was no fence and no loophole in it. Suddenly the water surface opened before them. Now at dawn, it looked like a mirror, reflecting the sky. Betty searched with her eyes, looking for mermaids and not finding on the shore a flock of girls in white, to the floor shirts, if they come out of the water, then they have legs, and not a tail wanted to run to the water, and look into the depths, maybe they will see them. Julia grabbed her by the shoulder with determination. Why? What if they're in there? Betty tried to wriggle out of her grasp. Look, there's a reed, the banks are waterlogged. If you fall in, I won't be able to pull you out. I can't swim. Calm down, mermaids won't come ashore here, in such mud. I see. Betty wrinkled her nose, thinking, let's go look from the bridge then. From where? Over there from the bridge. Julia didn't notice it, but to their right, about twenty paces away, there were three old plank bridges stretching over the water, and no railings. If you can't swim, you can hold on to the planks and swim. Because it's deep. Julia looked at the girl incredulously. Did you check, or what? Betty sighed. They chased me out of here, they wouldn't let me. Uncle Barry did. He told me about it later. He even showed me. He dived in with his hand up and stuck his fingertips out of the water. He said, that's how deep it is. Julia put her arm around his shoulders. At this hour of dawn, there was still that chilling cold, with which winter reminds of itself as if I am, I was recently, and I will come again. In the middle of summer it does not dare to do such a thing, in the middle of sultry days even waiting for the night coolness, to rest from the stuffiness. But it's cool there, and now it's a glacier. It's like an iceberg somewhere. Julia knew it was alright, the sun would come up soon and it would be a warm day. But for now, a sweater, or a sweater now. Look, Betty suddenly blurted out, look who's here, look at that. Julia raised her head in involuntary fright. Was it the dog or the wolf? But no, it was the boy from the castle. He had approached so stealthily so quietly that they both saw him just now. He too was looking at them with unspeakable surprise. Bah, who are these midnight girls? Half dawn, Betty clarified, the sun will be up soon. What are you doing here so early? Are you looking for mermaids too? The boy raised his eyebrows and looked at Julia, waiting for an explanation. Julia was confused. You'd think she'd come for the same thing, seriously hoping to see a flock of girls in white shirts lounging in the moonlight, like in a Kranzkoy painting. Legends, legends, 
Julia almost sang in that voice that adults use when they don't want their children to understand. You can disbelieve it, but you can test it. And she nodded a little for Betty, saying, she's the ringleader. But the shores are marshy, Julia continued in the same voice, so I don't think anyone will settle here. It's only clean by the bridges, and there's no way to get across. Why not? The boy straightened up, there's a raft tied up over there, and they use it. Julia stood a little behind her little companion, so Betty did not see how she waved her arms, crossing them and making grimaces do not continue, say, the topic fraught, but the boy did not understand. They often swim to the other shore in the fall. There are cottages here, everything is trampled, thousands of paths, and there the forest is quite deep. Well? And mushrooms, what else? Betty interrogated him with glowing eyes. The boy shrugged. I've been there only twice. It's a small lake, but I'm wary. His smile was quick and embarrassed. He walked toward them, so as not to raise his voice when he told them. And Julia noticed that she was up to his chin. How old is he? I didn't think it was possible on such a small and quiet lake. But there, in the center, if you draw a line from that willow tree to the shore and divide it in half. Yeah, there's a whirlpool. I was swimming, pushing off the bottom with a pole, and suddenly the pole lost its footing, and I felt the raft pulling, spinning. I intercepted the pole, started paddling with it like an oar, but I thought at first I wouldn't get out. Should I jump off the raft, swim back? But the whirlpool can pull a good swimmer away, and I didn't expect it here. But I got out after all. I didn't go back to the other shore, I took the raft back here. And then my friend and I wanted to know how deep is it. If you get into a whirlpool, you have to let it drag you to the bottom, and then push off from the bottom and swim out. But everywhere here it's about two meters and a half at most. And there, closer to that place, we threw a rope with a stone tied to it. It didn't reach the bottom. We tied two ropes and again it was not enough. It's better not to dive here. You can't hold enough air in your chest to resurface. You'll get too much, you'll drown. Betty looked at Julia with a look of triumph, as if to say, there? And you doubted it. There's an entrance to the underworld. What's your name? Julia asked the boy. And again the same embarrassed smile. So still, did you only come here for the mermaids? What about you? Betty asked with assertiveness. I'm here for the fish. Harry seemed to understand how to talk to her. I live here with my grandfather, and he told me to set the net tonight. Only there's no catch today. Do they let you leave the house in the dark like that? I don't think the grown-ups realize that the little guys run off again. Julia put her hand on the girl's shoulder. I don't know if she'll get hurt, but I probably will. I'm hoping my note will keep my mom from fainting. I kind of went to watch the sunrise. Well, if that's the case, let's go to our house for tea. Grandpa gets up early, and sometimes he doesn't even go to bed at night, he's working. When I left, I heard him putting the kettle on the stove. Betty's eyes sparkled, and it was clear that she liked the suggestion very much, and she expected there would be cakes or sandwiches or something to satisfy her hunger. The child is growing up, thought Julia piteously like an adult. She was more interested in seeing what the castle was like inside. They were walking along the cottage streets and Julia was already recognizing them as she had settled in so quickly and she was pleased that Harry, who kept a couple of paces ahead, kept looking back to see if they were keeping up, if they were coming. He pushed that castle door open so easily that Julia wanted to ask if where a few of these streets of local Rublevokas, in the best places, by the forest, by the river. They're crowded, crawled on top of each other mansions, stylized then the palace of the 19th century, then some Italian palazzo, then the fabulous East. But in an effort to demonstrate the luxury that they can afford, the owners were busy putting plastic windows and polycarbonate awnings. No one approached their house with care, as if it were a museum, did not collect antiques one piece at a time. And it was funny, as if the cabbage claimed to be a rose, a rare green rose, but it couldn't fool anyone. Harry's grandfather didn't spoil anything, and so they sat in the kitchen, spacious but dark, the narrow windows only just below the ceiling. Instead of a lamp, a lantern hung from the ceiling, and Julia was running her finger over the boarded table, tracing patterns of wood. Remembered this table for how long? It was at least half a century old, and Harry poured tea from a strange teapot into small cups, and with a wink to Julia, he shook off a large piece of bread, put two thick slices of boiled sausage on it, and held out the sandwich to the giant Betty, who accepted it with delight. They were drinking tea, with some herbs in it, 
and the aroma of it brought to Julia's mind the tales of Aladdin. If only there were oriental sweets in it, and Harry asked Julia. What do you do here all day long anyway? Aren't you bored? Julia shrugged a little. We've only just arrived here now, while I've been wrapped up in this whirlwind, nodding at Beatty. And you? You can't get bored with my grandfather. I mean, it's usually the young ones who get bored here. While their parents are doing country stuff like weeding and harvesting, they have nowhere to go. The lake and the woods are all the fun. And the internet connection is bad. You can't play games, you can't chat, and everyone wants to go back to the city. My grandfather used to say to me, Harry, why are you hanging around here, near me? I'd have looked all over with the boys, gotten to the forest cordon, found Nessie at the bottom of the lake, and you'd have strapped yourself to the house. But all the boys are here. Can't wait to leave. Sure they've been exiled here. You don't call a guy like that to go to the back country. Doesn't your grandfather want to come with you? Come on, I'll introduce you, Harry stood up. If you're in a hurry, let's go see him for a few minutes. He's in his office in the tower. How could you go to the tower without being called? To the amazement of both girls, there was an elevator two floors up in the castle. And when they got to the top, Harry opened the door in front of them. The first thing Julia saw were the windows, tall narrow ones in the semicircle. She would like that in her room too, so that the sun would go from one window to another from dawn to dusk. And at night, the stars would slowly glide around her bed in a circle. And then she saw a man. He was sitting at his desk, and he turned around with his wheelchair to face those who entered. Perhaps his figure had grown slim from months of immobility, but Julia had not noticed it at first. The chair was unusually large, majestic, not an invalid warrior in a chariot. Elongated face, high forehead, squinting eyes, and a pipe, a smoking pipe. Only in old movies was there such a thing. Early guess, Rampa said, what could be better? Please. And he waved his hand, inviting the girls to sit down. Now that they were looking around, looking for a place to sit, they could see the study. For the first few minutes they could see nothing but their grandfather. By one of the central windows stood a desk, an unusual red-brown wood, covered with green cloth. And no computer, familiar to the eye, just stacks of papers. The pause of a few seconds seemed long to Betty. What do you write? She asked, and unexpectedly for the older boys she expressed the idea quite accurately stories. I fell on my back and hit the rocks hard. I couldn't breathe because of the pain. I'm lying there, and I see the sky between the edges of the crack. It's so beautiful, the ice and the pure blue. It's not even scary to die, by God. That guy brought the lifeguards. It was their job to come down to me, to give me an anesthetic injection, to lift my body, and then bring it down on an agja. It's a sled. It's a rescue sled, and they operated on me at night. I remember my doctor didn't look very happy afterwards. He said, it's a bad leg fracture, Mickey. You'd have limped anyway. You'd limp, but you'd walk. But there's nothing you can do about your spine, so you'll have to find yourself a chair to ride through life in. What could I do? I was still young. I had a lot of strength. So I decided if my body doesn't work, let my imagination work, and take me where my legs couldn't take me and I wrote my first book about the Caucasus. I collected all the strange, inexplicable, mysterious stories that happened to mountaineers, and it turned out that there's much more mystical in life than little believers think. No, well, I never thought that I would quarrel with you. Lucy walked back and forth on the small veranda, and it became immediately noticeable how close it was here, so sprawling were her steps. I always dreamed that with my daughter, we would be like two friends. And you, in the middle of the night, Julia didn't say anything. She knew she had to let her mom say it all, all the way to the bottom. Only then, and only then after a while, would it be possible to live as before. Well, this girl, Tumbleweeds. Okay, if her grandmother doesn't care if this ball of mercury survives the summer or not. But you running off in the dark. You know there could be drunks in there. Yeah, some drunken group, and you wander right into their arms. Mom, what kind of drunk at four o'clock in the morning? They've been asleep for a long time. How do you know? Lucy stopped and stared at her daughter. Mom, I'm going to be like Betty. It is on her tongue all the time Uncle Alexander, Aunt Casey, but at least remember the alcoholics from our entrance. They booze till late at night, and then they fall asleep like the dead, and you have to wake them up. Betty and me, even if we found a drunk, we wouldn't do it. Lucy just waved her hand, and then she turned to her daughter. Well, and to fall into this damn lake you could. 
Any time of day or night, please. I'm still a nay fool. No, if you look for adventures on your head, you'll get them on your sorry ass. To be alone again, without me. Nowhere. Ever. Julia wondered if the rambunctious mom could hear their little guest. Beatty had run home after their morning voyage. Shown herself to grandma. And in half an hour was already riding on Julia's wicket. Betty was a well-bred girl. She waited to be invited. To hasten the moment, she pushed off with her foot, the wicket creaking open and closed. It's beyond me. Mom said, it's worse than a knife through glass. Call your new girlfriend, we'll have tea and scones. Betty appreciated not only the buns, but also the sausage sandwiches, yesterday's soup, macaroni and cheese, and a chocolate bar, mesmerized by undead mermaids and kikimura, foresters and witches. In the talking bunny, she could believe only conditionally for kids composed, but in the fact that in the woods, the woodsmen can frighten you, knock you off the path, that somewhere out there in the thicket, there is a hut and its mistress is able to conjure in this Julia believe sacredly. Gogol had assured her of this once, describing mystical creatures so authentically that there could be no doubt they were there, but God forbid they should be seen. And for the thousandth time, Julia trembled over May night, and the whole story convinced Betty that it was better not to go to the lake, because among the mermaids there is a witch, she again crept into their flock, and if you meet her then? A light knock on the wicked gate startled the girls, and even Betty shuddered violently. Who's that? Your mom would just open it and walk in, wouldn't she? Julia rose involuntarily from the steps and saw that Harry was loitering outside the gate. Grandfather asked for you, he began, and Julia saw that he could not hide his joy. He was happy that she was home. We can't, Betty said regretfully, that's when Julia's mom gets back, and she'll ask her to leave. Lucy arrived tired and upset, the director's wife was in hospital, and there was talk of moving her to intensive care. She let Julia go easily. Just don't stay out till dark. And they sat in the kitchen, at the long table, all together, and ate kebab. Grandpa called the traders he knew, can I buy meat for shish kebab from you? They said, come, we have brought rams and we will slaughter the one you point your finger at. Grandpa wrinkled his nose and said, Harry, I can't sentence anyone to death. You go, you know, to the poultry farm store, take something from them that you can thread on skewers. Chicken is a brainless bird, it's not a pity. Well, grandfather made the sauce himself, his friends from the coppices taught him. Maybe this is a secret sign of friendship. Mickey said thoughtfully, try the Sacton. Every time I make it I remember my buddies. Memo. Friendship is in the touch. Not just in the heart, but in the tongue. The next day, the walk almost went wrong. When Julia woke up, she thought it was too early, it wasn't even dawn. But when she looked out the window, she saw that the sky was covered with low clouds. It was warm and breezy out of the garden, but there was a light drizzle from time to time. And where shall we go? Lucy reasoned aloud, trying to convince not only her daughter, but also herself. She too, had already decided to spend the day idly, but it would pour, and there was nowhere to hide. Lucy made tea, sliced bread, cheese, and sausage. She put butter on the table. Julia imagined them sitting here all day in the little cottage. You can't go out into the garden, it's damp and dirty. Mama sues, and she herself languishes at her books, because if she sits down to read them in the morning, she'll be done by evening. And most of the books she has brought here are already read, so to go round and round. A day can still be tolerated, but if the bad weather is established for a long time. Well, let's go anyway, Julia asked her mother, not expecting much success. There's asphalt everywhere, you said, so it's not muddy. We'll take an umbrella. Lucy hesitated. The forest smells so good now, wet leaves, earth. But everything decided by itself. They hadn't finished drinking tea yet when the sun peeped through the clouds and lit up the raindrops on the glass with diamonds. Get dressed, Lucy said, but we'll take an umbrella. Both of them, without speaking to each other, wondered whether to take Betty with them. If we ignore the girl, the resentment will be deadly. I don't even know where she lives, Julia said. Lucy understood her without words. Okay, let's leave it up to the grandmother's discretion. If she lets her granddaughter come with us, but there's no peace in that case. A quarter of an hour later they knocked on the wooden gate. The cottage where Betty lived was only a little larger than their own. But it was obvious that people had lived here a long time and had already adapted every- Wallpaper lay crookedly, 
paint bloated, as if a first grader had taken a brush. The door of the cottage was ajar, they heard an angry cry, and on the path to them already hurried an elderly full woman. She was wrapped in a blue tassel shawl, and was the kind of classic grandmother Julia had seen in baby pictures. She needed a rocking chair, knitting needles, and a cat at her feet. I'm sorry please, she said, hurrying up before she reached them, I'm not going with you today. She's down with a fever of 38. No, no, not COVID. Instead of staying at home and drinking tea and crumpets, she went to Uncle Senius and he gave her a sausage. He doesn't have a refrigerator. God knows how long and where that sausage had been lying around. Betty was throwing up all night, I was sitting with her. Shouldn't we go to the pharmacy? Some medicine? Lucy looked at her daughter, we could go. Or we could sit with Betty while you go in. You know, I've probably got more medication than the hospital has. You have any idea what this little shooter is capable of? The screaming behind us got worse. Grandma looked back apprehensively and sighed. You go where you're going, and I'll try to endure this fight. Of course they made a mistake. They did not follow the asphalted road, which twisted along the slope, so it seemed to them too long, and they decided to take the mountain in the forehead. All the more so because it had already turned sunny. It stopped raining completely, and the ground began to dry up. Only the top of the mountain was still in low clouds, or in fog. Lucy went first. It was clear where to climb higher and higher. But there was no path, and in some places they had to wade through the grass, sometimes just climbing the stony slope, stepping into holes. And then Lucy stopped abruptly, as if she had hit something and said, Excuse me please. What's in there? Julie asked. A snake, can you believe it? A viper, I think. No, we're two idiots. We should have gone on the road. Lucy searched for a few minutes for a stick, finally found one long enough, and now she felt the grass before she stepped on it. They took a couple of breaks. Both were already out of breath from the arduous climb and took a long rest. Out they climbed to the final stretch of road, which now ran gently along the summit to the telemast, and Julia breathed a sigh of relief that nothing like her dream was here. If she hadn't known better, she would have thought they were in an ordinary forest with a highway leading through it. Nothing unusual, nothing mysterious was here. There was a metal fence up ahead, a narrow gate in it, and a bell button. No one was allowed in here for nothing. Behind the fence was a two-story building and a mast, a needle pointing up into the sky. Now you could see it up close, but here it didn't seem so thin and sharp as it was at the foot of the mountain. Indeed, she was covered from top to toe with plates, and it made her fat. It seemed that the fence could not go around the forest everywhere. Well, where shall we go now? Lucy asked a little confused. I thought there was at least an observation deck. We'll see the city from above. We'll take pictures with our phones. Take pictures. There's a haze down below. They noticed a guard walking on the other side of the fence. A short, gaunt, gray-haired man in a black uniform suit. You can't come in without a pass, he said. We understand, Lucy sighed. The mountain looks different from below. But here it's a thicket. The guard understood. You take a right. There's a path along the fence that leads to a clearing. That's where tourists usually go. Lucy thanked him with a sense of relief. It was not for nothing that they had climbed for an hour. She imagined how sore her muscles would be tomorrow. The trail did indeed soon lead them to a place where the forest receded. And Lucy almost gasped. Julia, look, I've never been this high before. The whole city is in the palm of my hand. And not only the city with its neighborhoods was in front of them, below them. In the distance, a silver ribbon lay the river, and all the surrounding mountains stretched below. And then Julia was beckoned by a man. A middle-aged man stood a dozen meters away from her. He smiled and made a gesture with his hand, beckoning the girl over. Julia was confused for a few moments, but this man seemed to know her well, and she had simply forgotten him. Julia glanced at her mother, who was thinking about something. She didn't want to distract her and walked towards the stranger. Lucy didn't know what the point of living was for her now. She told herself when Julia was found, she should bury her, put up a monument, make it like everyone else, a decent granite monument so that her daughter would not lie under an overgrown mound. It was an external reason that lay on the surface, clear to everyone around her now, because no one believed that the missing girl would be found alive. If she hadn't been found in the first few days, then she wasn't a little girl. If there was a chance to come or a chance to call for help, she'd take it. And if she didn't, opinions differed as to what might have happened. 
What was clear was that it was no accident. The mountain was searched repeatedly by police and volunteers. They went around every tree, looked under every bush. There were no cliffs to fall off and crash from. Not just a body, but no trace of blood from top to bottom. So someone stole Julia, took her with them. But at least something must have been left behind. Traces of a struggle, some broken branches, a scrap of cloth from her dress something. She couldn't go willingly with the kidnappers. Whatever story they beckoned her with, she would warn her mother. Lucy didn't doubt that, unlike the police. For some reason they allowed that Julia could have reacted to someone. Girl, come here, help, for a moment. Of course, then brought in the dogs. Two sinologists came. A guy with a Rottweiler and a girl with a Spaniel. These were all the service dogs in their town. They were trained primarily to search for explosives and drugs. The Rottweiler found nothing. Check thoroughly sniffed the entire observation deck and sat down with a look. You cannot worry, master. There's no bomb or heroin here. But Amble, the Spaniel, sniffed Julia's green knit sweater, literally driving his nose on the ground, and trotted down the barely visible path. And not only Nancy's canologist, but the rest of the police and the gawking tourists, who had been chased as fast as they could, hurried after him. Lucy, too, though her legs wouldn't carry her. She imagined the dog would lead the way to the body. Ambu dived first into a little hollow, and then climbed up to the second peak, the bump. And without hesitation, he rushed into a small cave, sunlit, visible through the sun. It was so shallow that only two or three people could take shelter here, as tourists sometimes did during the rain. The cave was examined with a magnifying glass, but not even a thread, not even a hair was found. Amble whimpered quietly and scratched the wall. Maybe you two came in here together? Nancy asked, pulling the dog away from her, afraid it would hurt its paws on the rocks. Lucy shook her head. A sense of unreality was taking hold of her more and more. It was replacing the cold terror she had felt when she found Julia gone. Only for a few minutes afterward did she remain calm waiting to see if the girl had gone into the bushes or if something had caught her attention and she had gone away, but would return. And then Lucy was thrashing and screaming, calling her daughter and begging those tourists with whom she had just talked to call the police. And as the call was not immediately believed, they offered to walk around the neighborhood and call again. We don't have many people. Now we will tear someone from his place and send him to you. By the time they come, your daughter will already be found and then we'll have no one to send. Why are you crying? We've never had anyone kidnapped before. Then there were cops, canines, gawkers and volunteers from Elizabeth Abbott. That night, the town must have been perplexed to see the mountain blowing. The rays of numerous flashlights glided, intertwined, multiplied. Lucy was tried many times to be taken home. She had refused with a note of terror in her voice, as if leaving here meant that Julia would be lost forever. She would never be found again. No, she must sit where she'd been the minutes her daughter had disappeared. If Julia comes back, it will be here. She knows her mother is waiting and worried. So she has to be here, or they'll miss each other. At last one of these people, many of whom had passed in front of her face that night, said that it was necessary to go to the police, and there they would question her in detail and record her statement. And there would still be policemen and volunteers here on the mountain, and if Julia came, then Lucy sat in the woman investigator's small office. She was always thirsty, and her mouth was so dry that even when she drank, it didn't go away. The investigator was not young thin, with red-dyed hair. Her uniform jacket smelled faintly of sweat. The investigator first asked her to tell in detail how everything happened when the mother noticed that her daughter had disappeared. Then she started asking questions. Maybe Julia had friends in town, and the girl wanted to meet them, but her mother wouldn't let her. Had Lucy noticed her daughter using drugs? Had she been missing before? Lucy wanted to clamp her ears and instead of answering, scream only. No, 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 no. No one here knew her girl. Julia couldn't leave without telling her. Even when she left the cottage at dawn, she left a note. You need to talk to a crisis counselor, the woman said. Absolutely. Apparently Lucy was so out of sorts now that it was striking. I'll write down the phone number and you can make an appointment in the morning. She's a very bit specialist. Why? Lucy's voice was usually sonorous, but it was half choked. She wanted to cough because she couldn't hear herself, but it wasn't what she wanted. She had a seizure, her throat was sandpaper, and she coughed so hard she was afraid she was going to throw up. 
Lucy ran out onto the porch, out into the fresh air. That's where the investigator found her, slumped on the steps. She stroked Lucy's shoulder and said in a different voice, a human voice. She must have had children herself. They're taking you now. Do you have the key to the city apartment with you? Apartment? Lucy asked, not quite understanding. Then she realized, no, I was promised I'd just talk to you and they take me back that way. She pointed to the mountain. She started breathing rhythmically again, careful not to have another attack. Where are you going now? The investigator almost whispered in her ear, there'll be people there all night. And what you eat now, after such a shock, is something to drink and sleep. At least have some vodka. I'll go, Lucy said, getting up. Where are you going? To the mountain. Wait, the investigator sighed hopelessly, I'll take you now. Then I'll be back. Wait, don't go. I'll just get the car keys, and I'll tell my people. And let's stop by your house to get some pictures of the girl. The latest ones we have. I wish she'd said the most recent, the latest pictures. It was beginning to dawn. Julia remained in the day of yesterday. A new day was beginning in which she was no longer there. And there were no clues. Lucy sat in the same place, waiting. The k unit had left. The guy with the Rottweiler walked past Lucy, silent. Nancy lingered, standing two paces away, hesitating to speak. The bastard did what he could. From here, the trail just stops, and there's nothing around, not even a hint. No scent. There was a pause. Lucy didn't know how long it lasted. When she looked up to where Nancy had been standing, she was gone. One of the policemen said that the information about the missing girl would be broadcast on local television and radio today, and tomorrow it would appear in the newspapers. Flyers will be posted around the city. But people were leaving the mountain, both police and volunteers. It's been searched a thousand times, and they realized they'd have to look for Julia somewhere else, maybe far away. At least keep your cell phone on at all times, the female investigator said as she parted from Lucy, we need to be in touch with you all the time. Any news? Any questions? Lucy was dead tired. She realized that she could sink down on the grass and fall asleep, or rather fall into oblivion for a while, even for a few minutes. But she was afraid to fall asleep. She might dream some happy dream or just a peaceful dream. And then she'd wake up and realize Julia was gone. It would be such a swing that her heart would burst. Where there was a road along the top of the mountain, cars passed by, those who serviced the television went to work. The watchmen had changed. The tourists would soon appear. She was not surprised to see a familiar doctor coming to her. In the most difficult moments he always appeared, as if from nowhere. It was not for nothing that she and her daughter called him guardian angel. It was impossible to find more accurate and not so banal words to describe the essence of their relationship. I wish Jack were with Julia right now. Let's go, he said, walking over to Lucy. She shook her head. Let's go, he repeated, and took her firmly under the elbow. He had graceful hands with long fingers. They could have belonged to either a musician or a surgeon. But his strength now was enough to make Lucy stand up. Jack led her to his car, a white Toyota. It had a 911 license plate. The cops must have put it there on purpose. Was there anyone in their town that Jack hadn't helped, that he hadn't treated? Lucy didn't ask him how he knew. The whole town must have known by now. He brought her to his hospital to the emergency room, which he ran, which he owned. All the nurses there idolized him, looked him in the mouth. He took Lucy to his office, where he not only worked, but also lived literally. How many times he slept here, on the sofa? Lie down, he told Lucy, pulling a pillow and blanket out of the closet. She shook her head. I can't sleep, she said, and he didn't recognize her voice. There was something mechanical in it, not quite human. I'll give you an injection. Laying his head on the pillow was comfortable in the sense that the tears were now flowing sideways, soaking into the pillowcase. The light from the lighted lamp on Jack's desk blurred. It was always a little semi-dark in his office. As the needle entered her arm, Lucy remembered. Yes, the phone. Turns out it was clutched in her hand. It wasn't easy to unclench her fingers. She shoved the device, hot and wet from her palm to Jack. I might get a call. If there's any news. He nodded, extinguished the lamp, and walked out, carrying her cell phone. She heard the key turn in the door. Then, already through sleep, she realized several times that there was a knock at the door, looking for Jack. In this dream or oblivion Lucy spent the whole day. 
Only when it began to get dark did she sit up on the couch, trying to come to her senses. Her head was so heavy that she shook it like a horse. Jack came in. He probably stopped by before, checking on her from time to time, making sure she was okay. No news, he said, realizing what she needed to know from him before anything else, looking. Everybody's looking, I'll make some coffee. Sugar or chocolate for you, Lucy. Stop it. You need to eat something. At least have some coffee. Your house is gonna be like a headquarters right now. You've got to hold on. You're gonna get a lot of calls. Call for a lineup? Do you realize that if she hasn't been found yet, then Dashka is dead. And Lucy finally burst into tears, terribly moaning wailing. It was not the first time the hospital had heard such sobs. On the first floor, in the waiting room, they used to bring in people so heavy that the doctors could do nothing. There was an operating room on the fourth floor, and there too, patients were sometimes left on the table. Or they left a little later, in the intensive care unit. And now, if someone walked down the corridor past the office, they might just flinch a little shiver, think that someone had just died. Jack didn't say Julia would be found. He couldn't lie. Lucy, he said, you still have to pull yourself together now. Get through this. God willing. God? She jumped up. I remember that legend they told you at the convent. Two boys were fishing and drowned in the Volga. One of them had a mother who was a believer and prayed fervently. They found the boy's body. She was able to bury him. And the other one just disappeared. It's like a mother's prayer will bring up the bottom. Why are you telling me this? Why? I won't be able to believe in anyone at all if Julia's. Drink your coffee, he said. I'm off work. I'll take you home now. But there are journalists waiting for you. They're waiting outside. And don't shake your head. You're not going back to the mountain now. Not to the mountain. To your dacha. I'll have my cell phone. So the police don't care where I'm staying. As long as I'm in touch. Oh yeah, the cell phone. Jack took it out of his pocket, handed it to her. It's fine. There was no one here. No one in the press had found out she bought this shabby little house with a ramshackle wooden fence. The car dived as it pulled in like a boat in the waves. The house stood looking out at them through the dark windows. The last time they'd left here with Julia. But people lived around it. The lights were glowing. And Jack held back. Didn't ask the question he was about to. Won't you be scared here? Instead he said. I wouldn't want you to do anything stupid. I won't go to the top at night. And I won't put my hands on myself. If that's what you mean. Thanks for what you did. Thank you for being there for me. And now I just want to be alone, you know? Go to your mom's. He had an old mama who would have flown off this earth like a dandelion into eternity if it hadn't been for his skillful hands and the fact that he was on guard every minute. Lucy walked toward the house. He was indeed afraid to leave her alone. He was very tired, as he was dead tired almost every day at work, but it would be easier for him to sit next to Lucy now and grab the cell phone, taking calls, hoping every time that now there would be a miracle and what would happen to Lucy if she was really asked to come to the lineup? When he drove back Lucy was right, his mother, who was 90 years old, could not be left alone at night, but tears stood in his throat, and it was hard to breathe. That night, the second night Julia wasn't around, Lucy didn't get a call. She called the police, forced herself to count down a couple of hours, and pressed the cell phone buttons again. She called the emergency room that way once, when her mother was in there after surgery. Her mother had peritonitis, and it was unknown whether she would live to see the morning. The call gave her an acute sense of relief while she was alive, which after a few minutes was replaced by anxiety and anticipation of the next call. And so now for Lucy, the most important thing was the news that Julia had not yet been found dead, which meant the search was still on. She realized the difference in that ICU was resolved in a matter of hours. The mother eventually got better. But now, how long do we have to wait? Day after day, week after week, maybe year after year, or a lifetime of waiting. Maybe there would come a moment when she couldn't stand this torture of hope and wish that at least her daughter's body had been found, that it would all be over. But not yet, not this. Harry came in the morning. Lucy jumped at the knock on the wicked door, but when she saw who it was she froze again. She'd been chased off the mountain, but here she could sit as long as she wanted, sinking into a half daze. The only thing that brought her relief was that Harry didn't have to explain anything. Everything was already known. Come and stay with us, the boy said. Come and stay with us. 
Grandfather's calling. There's plenty of room. The reporters will be here soon, and you'll have no peace. They won't be able to take our castle. It can withstand any siege. Harry was leading Lucy as if you were in charge. I'll help you move your things. I'll carry everything in a few steps, the sewing machine and the mannequins. Do you think I can sue? Lucy asked. The summer was beautiful, serene, full of gentle languor. Lucy imagined what those who had taken her away, or those to whom she had been given, might have done to Julia, and she was so horrified that she jumped up and ran out of the balcony and somehow kept herself on edge so as not to throw herself down. One chance, maybe there's one more chance in a million that Julia's alive. Not far away, the night woods rumbled, smelling of lake water and of the matiola that grew in the yard, in large clay bases. When Harry went out in the morning to get milk, he often saw Lucy's loose hair hanging over the iron fence, so she had fallen asleep on the balcony again, dropping her head in her arms. News was still coming in, the search for Julia was still on. But there were no leads in her case like there were in other cases. There was no credible evidence that anyone had seen her anywhere. Nothing but rumors. A woman spoke up. A man called. A fortune teller told a fortune. I think there was a girl who looked just like her. The rumors were never confirmed. And Lucy knew that soon the search would inevitably fade away. And now Lucy stood in the middle of the cell and looked around in horror. This was something she had never imagined in her wildest dreams. She had never been in close contact with the world of prison, and the people who had been sentenced had always been far from her. All her knowledge of this world was limited to history books, political prisoners of the 20th century, the sad 58th article, rehabilitation. And these grinning faces that were now all around her were clearly far from politics. They wanted only one thing. Why had Billy thought up a punishment worse than death for her? That's what her ex-husband wanted. Once he had pretended to do the honorable thing of leaving Lucy and his daughter with one sports bag, leaving everything to them. It was admitted that the apartment was originally let nines. True, Billy had done the repairs, but he couldn't have taken it with him, could he? He took the car, of course, and Lucy never said a word. Julia's father also paid symbolic alimony, and acquaintances helped him cheat on the paperwork. And Lucy never argued, never asked him for money or gifts for her daughter. Billy thought he could easily cut her out of his life. After all, he was still young. Obviously, he would soon marry. There would be more children, sons. However, everything went wrong. From Lucy, Billy went back to his mother. The middle brother went to another city, settled there, and the youngest began to drink. His mother tried to fight it, but every night when Billy came home, he found his brother in an inebriated state. Harvey was going down that staircase that led only downward. His mother hid the alcohol, did not give the younger one a penny, but he began to take things out of the house, selling them for pennies, just enough for a hangover. Mother only in recent years, with the help of her sons, bought herself a few dresses, a fur hat, good boots. She even bought her first gold earrings. At home there was a carpet, then a colored TV. And all this Harvey took out and sold. Mother was desperate, didn't know what to do. Billy tried to get his brother into a drug treatment center, but there, Though the doors were strong and locked securely, they couldn't keep Harvey out, and it started all over again. Billy waved his hand. Lucy had been right, her husband had had mistresses from time to time. And now he'd gone to one of them, the one who seemed best suited to be his wife. Selena lived in her house, made it cozy sewing and knitting, weaving lace. Afterward, Billy thought he was drawn to a certain type of woman, gentle Neva woman. But the 19th century had passed, and neither Selena nor any of Billy's later friends agreed to regard him as their unconditional master, to do exactly as he said, to adjust their lives to his interests. Selena sang well, several times a week went to the Palace of Culture, where she was a soloist in the ensemble. And on those evenings Billy had to make do with a cold dinner, and the ensemble often traveled to perform. Billy was not able to instill in the woman that her husband should be her first priority. Selena didn't want children either. She, like Billy, grew up the eldest in a large family, babysat in her time with the kids, and now did not want to plunge back into these diapers and porridge. And there was nothing Billy could say that Selena owned the house. Then he had Katie. They had met in an apartment that belonged to a friend of hers who had gone abroad. Then Sarah, who owned a nice country house. Sarah was the one who finished him off. A wealthy woman, she was married, 
above her husband spoke with a slight disdain of her spouse. Not young, the appearance of unattractive. Billy repeatedly offered Sveta to divorce her husband and marry him for Serioza. But the woman only dismissively waved her hand. You won't earn money for my wants. This hurt Billy, and more and more he grew angry with Lucy, the quietest of all his women. They could have had a good family. A boy would have been born after their daughter. But Lucy had ruined everything. And when Julia disappeared, in him like lightning flash, he decided to take revenge on his ex-wife. This sadistic plan he came up with, knowing Lucy well. She won't complain to anyone. She's too shy, too bashful. Let her live and suffer, consider herself forever stained, after she was rubbed off by the whole camera. But when he opened the door the next day, expecting to find his tortured wife, he was stunned. Lucy was dozing, her head resting in the lap of an elderly criminal. And judging by the woman's clothes, no one had touched her at all. The old man lightly rubbed the sleeping woman's shoulder. Lucy, get up. There's someone here for you. Billy retreated to the wall. Now he was afraid. What had his meek little mouse of an ex-wife done? What had she said? Why did the cons take her for their own? Lucy walked past him like he was nothing. She was in a hurry to get home. When yesterday she stood in the middle of the cell, ready to faint from horror and disgust, this old man, apparently an authority figure, said to her, Don't be afraid, Lucy. Come here. It seemed mystical to her. He couldn't possibly know her name. A good man asked for you. We were looking for your daughter. What? Zek grinned. It doesn't matter if we're in prison or out. We got our own channels. We've been looking for her for a long time and we found her. Is she alive? She's alive, nodded the old man. There's a psycho in there, a scumbag. But he's a charming one. Eve lured pretty girls, then put a rag up his nose and get in the car. Then he'd decide what to do with them. He gave younger ones to childless spouses as daughters, and older ones to rich men, as servants, as girlfriends. Don't yell. There's nothing wrong with yours. He didn't have time to sell her off. They'll let you out of here and you'll go to her. Lucy was given strong sweet tea, and she slept the night covered with the old man's jacket. Who asked for me? She asked him. There was an unusual warmth in the convict's gaze, as if he remembered something good. A friend of mine, we were young then, we used to go to the mountains together, and when I fell into a crevasse, he pulled me out. He broke himself, became an invalid, but he saved me. So I owed him a debt of gratitude. And now Lucy was in a hurry to get home. She knew Julia was waiting for her there. Thank you for watching this video to the end. Subscribe to the channel. Like it, write comments if you like the story, and see you on the channel.